This man strangled his wife in front of three of their children, then told them to pretend it was a normal day. She, I had to go through so much on her own, without anyone. And she just deserves to be able to be first properly. Tonight on Crime Watch, the shame of the so-called honor killers. Hello, welcome to Crime Watch. And that man we're after for killing his wife in front of his family is officially described as one of Britain's most wanted criminals. Well, some of Britain's most senior detectives are here to act as your calls come in. And the number to get them is right there. It'll be there throughout the programme. And we have a specialist team of officers here solely to take calls on a separate number from anyone with concerns or suspicions about honour killing. The desperately wrong response in some families to what they see as the shame brought on them by a wife or a child who steps out of line. And that number's 0800 056 477. And we've got some faces that you wouldn't want to meet in a well-lit street, never mind a dark alley. We'll tell you more, more about what these have been up to shortly. They're all on the run, and we've given them numbers to help you ID them if you're going to ring in. So if you've got their number, you call ours. Spaghetti Junction in Birmingham may be Britain's biggest motorway intersection, but underneath it, and for quite a way around it, especially in Great Bar, there's a maze of canals and pathways, and down there below the traffic, a very strange and disturbing young man has been on the prowl. I set off early that day to fetch up my granddaughter from the nursery as they were breaking up and to take a few recycling bottles and papers to the recycling plant. I went walking through and as I'm three quarters of the way in, I see this young man coming through at the other end. As he walked past me, he was staring and I thought to myself, well, thank God he's gone. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, what's that? What's happened? And then from the peripheral of my eye, I saw him. And I thought, oh, my God, he has turned on me. He has come back. was hitting me. He was so calm and so calculating. He seemed as if he didn't want to get his clothes dirty. He didn't say anything. He was silent all the way through. Not even a grunt, like with aggression. You know, you, mm, mm, nothing. There was, it was silent. After the last blow, he stopped for that second, staring, just like a zombie. And then I got up and ran for my life. We thought we were dealing with a really nasty attack, but a one-off until the 29th of September. I was about halfway down the path in the grassy area when I noticed a man walking towards me. He walked past me and then a few seconds later I heard heavy footsteps but I didn't think to look behind me. I saw that it was the same man, which I thought was a bit strange. And he carried on walking towards the wooded area and disappeared. I was walking through the woods and almost to the end of the park. I didn't hear anybody behind me. The next thing I know, I'm lying on the floor, wondering what's happened. I start searching for my glasses. The first thing I did when I got up was to check he was OK, because he was crying. The only thing I could think of was to get my phone to call for help, but I couldn't even see the numbers on the phone to dial anybody. All I could think about is getting out of the park, thinking he, he might come back to finish me off. 
Here's a guy who's whacked an elderly widow and a pregnant mother over the head with a brick. I just can't understand it and I still struggle to understand why it's happened. Luckily, he hasn't killed anybody yet. But if he's not caught, he will do. Well, let's hope we catch him before she's proved right. He is a very weird and worrying character. And incidentally, he broke her ankle, but she still managed to get herself up and run out of the park. And the one thing we've got is that both victims gave us efics, didn't they? Yeah, and they're really uh, interesting efics, because although different witnesses, you know, they look at him and they give different portraits of him. If you look at them, there's, there's one. And if you switch across and look at the other, at face value, well, face value, <laughs> there, there is difference there because of the hair. But actually, if you put them together, look at the similarities, and both describe him as very baby-faced with sort of yellowish skin, and both say automaton, zombie-like. And that's the thing. Although we didn't mention the reconstruction, there was a, a woman who saw this man on the morning of the second attack, didn't she? And she was so terrified by what he looked like, just by his appearance, that she, she ran off. Yeah, he has this very strange, you know, look. And incidentally, he was wearing different clothes in the morning to when he was in the afternoon. So what does that tell us? Presume that he, he's local then, that he's somewhere he was able to go to change. Well, it might mind. be. And certainly the forensic psychiatrist we've spoken to is convinced the guy is local and says, look, he doesn't think this behaviour is switched on and off. He doesn't think he's in a drug-induced sort of thing. This is him. This is what he's going to be like he will probably be rather alarming and disturbing to women all the time that uh, some people will think he's got Asperger's or something but it, we don't know what he is but he is like this much of the time so the thing is he's not gonna be able to hide this behavior is he that that's the thing people will know this about him and he'll be known for it I imagine. absolutely but we have got DNA so if people got any ideas at all any suspicion he didn't seem to care who saw him you saw how close he was to, to the houses and other people wandering around could have easily seen him he's left his DNA in a brick we've got that so uh, if you know him if you think you do well you know the number to call 0500 600 600 and now DC Rav Worlding has some villains caught on camera and the first one you couldn't make it up an armed robber who turned up on a motorbike with a gun and managed to lose control of both this is a scene of a cocked up hold up if it wasn't for the fact someone could have been killed it would be comical this is the character we're looking for He's bought a motorbike on eBay and he's fixing to meet the seller. He drops a big clue. We'll come back to that. He pays cash but wants the bike to steal cash from a business in Hatfield. He's a bit shaky on his new wheels. This is more than a bit scary because he's also in charge of a loaded semi-automatic pistol. The owner spots he's up to no good and tries to slam the door, but the gunman forces his way in. They end up on the floor as office workers look on, scared out of their wits. Other staff pile in. It's now total chaos. One kicks the bike over to stop the getaway. Now, the owner has the gun. But Bike Boy wants it back. The ex-gunman takes off, leaving the bike, one of his gloves, and his ex-gun. And that earlier clue he dropped? A family photo, maybe. If you know who this is, or better still, who Bike Boy is, call us before he does himself or someone else serious injury. The sparks are flying in this holiday park in Bognor Regis. These two are taking an angle grinder to an ATM cash machine. They eventually get their hands on the cash and sneak out. But the camera got a sneak preview of them when they sneaked in. Do you know the young lad with the crowbar? Can't quite make out the logo on the older man's cap. Come on, Pop, come a bit nearer. That's it, it says Land's End. Maybe they're a father and son team. You tell us. This lot's addiction to nicotine and alcohol is serious. This is the third time in two months the same man's taken his mates to the cash and carry in Handsworth in Birmingham. They've lifted £20,000 worth of booze and fags and even the odd cash till. Here's the ringleader again. This one likes to show off his pants and even manages a smile for the camera. This one's got Adidas tracky bottoms. If you can help break their expensive habit, let us know. 
These two do actually pay for what they're after, even having a laugh and a joke with a cashier. But later that night, the can of petrol they buy goes through the letterbox and windows of a house in Walthamstow. Inside, a mum, two kids and four lodgers. One is trapped in the fire and suffers serious burns. We know this man is Tunga Raja Tyson because he's now doing 10 years for this arson. But we need to find the other fella. Here's another pair with a sense of humour, but no sense of decency. They're all smiles and high fives outside a nightclub in Hackney until a Polish bloke, who's had a few, starts shouting the odds at a man on the door. The big fella's disappeared. We need to find him. One of the jokers skips behind the Polish lad and punches him to the ground. The two then kick and stamp on his head. While he's on the pavement with a broken jaw, they get back to joking around. One phone call can wipe the smile off their faces. So please, if you know any of that lot, get dialing 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 83199 just start your message with the letters CW still to come where's the honor in so-called honor killings now go outside okay and pretend nothing happened is that okay yeah just pretend it's a normal day come on let's go it's not a normal come on. day I said come on come on you just don't stop, my crying. Mom. stop crying stop crying let's go let's go five years on from what was done to their mother those children are still weeping and who wouldn't be, as you'll see later, their father has got to be found. Rosemary Walsh was one of those people who, given a choice, would rush to the aid of anyone in trouble. It was her great misfortune to run into someone who, given the same choice, would run a mile. Thousands of people use this road every day, travelling from the home counties into London and around London. The driver I'm interested in finding may have been travelling home after a night out, may have been travelling into work. Wherever that person arrived, they would have arrived with a damaged car and a damaged conscience. Because that morning they hit Rosemary Walsh and left her for dead. It was just after four in the morning on Sunday the 19th of March so the roads would have been really quiet. It happened on the southbound stretch of the A406 near Redbridge. Rose and myself have been together for uh, 28 years, and all that time she's always been full of life, very happy, hated to see anybody suffer. Um, just the life was great, I mean, she, you know, couldn't get enough. She especially like going to the car boot sales to buy stuff, uh, especially toys and things for the kids. So always looking out for things that they would like to play with. And if other people wanted anything, she'd always look out and get them something as well. And that morning, she reached over, kissed me goodbye, and rushed off about an hour earlier than she needed to leave, really. Um, she had to meet some friends there. It was her first time to that boot market. She always got this idea that she might get lost and wouldn't find her way, but she always did. first time that Rose had actually gone to help someone. She'd been walking along the canal one day and she saw someone drowning. She re leaned over and pulled him out, uh, despite the fact that she was terrified of water and couldn't swim. I 
if a Rose had been driving a car and had hit someone, she would have stopped right away, would never have given it a second thought. Even if it was her fault, she still would have been out there to help them. But this person never thought about helping her, and they just drove off. The car that killed Rosemary had been travelling at 60 miles an hour. It was a red Citroen Zara. It braked before it hit her, but it would have collided with her at 40 miles an hour. She landed 20 metres away. The driver of this car has a serious problem. They arrived somewhere with severe damage to their car. Perhaps the bonnet was dented, the roof dented, the windscreen broken. What I know for certain is the passenger wing mirror is missing. I need to know who repaired that car and where it is now. That morning, the driver would have been acting erratically, in a panic. It was a heartless act not to stop and help her. Where is that person now? And incidentally, the man that Rosemary went to help survived that crash. The person we're after tonight is the person who was driving that red Citroen Zara, made between 1999 and 2004, and it's missing this wing mirror. Now, all sorts of people would have seen that damaged car back in March. Did you give an estimate to repair that car? Did you do the repair? Now, Rosemary was hit so hard, she landed 20 metres in front of that car. The driver cannot fail to know what he or she did. Do you know somebody suddenly got rid of a red Citroen Zara back in March or was behaving strangely around that time? Witnesses say the driver stopped. We saw going back there in that reconstruction there for a moment or two, moment or two before speeding off. There is no question that person knew what had happened. If you know who it was, shot them. There's a £10,000 reward. Half of it has been put up by Rosemary's family. The other half has been put up by Crime Stoppers. All calls to Crime Stoppers are confidential. If you want to call them anonymously, the number, another free phone number, is 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Now let's take a closer look at 12 of Britain's most wanted. These are faces we need your help on. And we've given them Num numbers to make it easy. Number one is Jaleel Ahmed, wanted for murder. The victim, who was disabled, had just celebrated his 23rd birthday when he was stabbed. Ahmed is 24 and he has connections in Birmingham and in London. Number two, John Wallace, wanted for attempted murder. His victim was stabbed seven times in a flat in Roehampton. Stevie Pittman's wanted for possession of cocaine with intense supply. And as you can see, have a look, he's got a large scar. You see it there? On his left cheek. And he is number three. Perry Nathaniel is dangerous. According to the police, he should not be approached. At any rate, not likely. The victim he shot at close range is still receiving treatment for brain injuries. Sometimes he turns his name the other way round, so watch out for Nathaniel Perry. And other aliases have so far included Perry Dobson and Carl Thomas. At least our number for him stays the same, number four. Now, if you know him or any of the others, you know what to do. Give us a call, 0500 600 600. Last month, we got almost 500 calls and emails and we showed what happened to Heather Barnett in Bournemouth. Her killer removed her breasts with a surgical scalpel and not surprisingly, we are extremely worried about what he's done since and what he may be up to now. You may remember he left another macabre clue at the scene, one that shows he's been assaulting other women in the town. It wasn't until we visited the crime scene in Capstan Road that we realised the sinister significance. Mum, are you in there? The door's stuck. Yeah, I'll get in. Mum? Mum? <laughs> the issue of this hair is absolutely critical, the inquiry, obviously. The man leading the inquiry is Detective Superintendent Phil James. Really big development since the last programme last month. Yes, Nick, a fantastic response, but in particular we're, we're very pleased that uh, three females came forward to say that they'd had their hair cut whilst travelling on buses in Bournemouth, and two females came forward to say that they witnessed such a thing. It's a real epidemic of this has been going on, and we've got two of those girls who've, who've 
come into the studio very courageously, given the circumstances of this. Tell us what, what happened to you. Obviously, we're not going to identify you. T tell us what happened to you. Uh, in my case, I was travelling on a bus to school um, when I felt as if somebody was pulling strands of my hair. And there was a strange smell, um, like menthol. I thought perhaps it was one of the children behind me just playing a trick, but I turned around and there was a man sat there. He had his hands on the top of the back of the seat, um, as if he was holding on. So I didn't really do anything else about it until I got off the bus. And I noticed that the, um, the menthol smell was coming from something sticky that was in my hair. And, what a sort um, of medicinal smell? It was rather like vapour rub, I thought. Um, when I tried to wash it out, I noticed that strands of my hair were falling out into the sink. They were all the same length as though they'd been cut. Um, I thought were probably with something quite sharp. And you got a good look at him, didn't you? Yes, I did. You got a good look at him as well. Tell us what happened in your case. Um, I was on my way home from work, um, and I was sat on the left-hand side of the bus. And on the right-hand side of the bus, there was um, a man on the back seat and a girl just in front of him. And I looked over and caught, saw him cut, cutting the girl's hair. Um, and he saw me see him, and that he just got off the bus when he saw me. You got a good look at him too? Yeah. What was he wearing? He was wearing um, something like a, a green anorak kind of puffer jacket. Now that's interesting, Phil, because we had CCTV last time in Charminster of a guy crossing the road. You think this is the murderer. He was also wearing some sort of, oh, it looks like, a bit, looks like a bit like a puffer jacket to me. Yes, the bus that we're talking about is travelling up that road. It's travelling up Charminster Road and the man is a very similar description with a very similar coat. Have you seen him again or was it just the one occasion? Yes, I have seen him since. You've seen him since. Have you seen him after Heather's murder? Yes. And what happened? I mean, you must have moved away from him, presumably. Um, I have tried to. Um, there have been occasions where I've moved away from him and he has um, then reappeared near, near to me. Really? Now, you, you must be worried if he's still stalking people. Yes, I believe that. That's not a coincidence, Nick. I believe that on those occasions that man was actually uh, following the individual. Uh, and it is very concerning, naturally. I mean, you've always been worried that this Heather Barnett's killing wasn't a one-off, that this guy is just going on and going on, and he's plainly still following women. Yes, he's still out there. He's in Bournemouth. He is a major concern to us. He is high risk, and we must now, catch him. You still need other women to come forward. In particular, there's one out there whose hair was actually placed on Heather Barnett's body. So, so we need more girls courageous like this to come forward. But. What about people who are very close to the killer, who might have suspicions and are frightened? What will happen to them? How much protection can you offer? We're very good at what we do. We're very professional. We can offer them the ultimate, which is full witness protection, uh, down to the instances here where the, the females are just remaining anonymous. But, you know, there's no problems there. We're very good at what we do. Phil, thank you girls very, very much indeed. Any information you have, however unsure you are, however much you may feel divided loyalties, is pretty clear. This man has carried on doing things he should not be doing after killing Heather. You've seen the CCTV, we've given descriptions of him. He may kill again, as Phil has just said. Don't have that on your conscience, please. Call us. If you've had your hair cut from a man behind you on a bus or a train or anywhere in the Bournemouth area, also, please call us. If you've been stalked by anyone of this description, call us. 0500 600 600. And you can see that uh, CCTV footage again on our website. You can find out more about how we've tackled the Heather Barnett case on bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Right, we've got some more wanted faces for you to look at now. Now, we've nailed a number onto them to help if you're going to ring in. First things first, number five, Terry O'Neill. He's a very dangerous man and also very tall, six foot three. He's wanted for stabbing two men in London's Canning Town. One later died from his injuries. There's a £20,000 reward on Mr O'Neill. Number six here, it's Mr Kamil Krawiec, a missing sex offender. He's Polish-born, he's an ex-waiter and has links in Hackney and Earl's Court. Seven here, Randolph McBean. He's wanted for firearms offences. 6'1", and a scar on the right side of his face. He also has gold teeth and street names of Geronimo or Ronimo. And here, number eight, it's Mr Ian Jones, and he's wanted for armed robbery. Two big giveaways here, 19 stone, and also has a tattoo of a dog on his right arm. Now, if you know or spot any of these, give us a call here in the studio. 0500 600 600. 
Now Detective Sergeant Jane Corrigan has some CCTV of a young man who's had his face rearranged by Saturday night thugs, hasn't he, Jane? And by the look of it, he's going to have this scar for the rest of his days. One minute, he's happily walking along eating pizza. The next, his smile's been replaced by an eight-inch gash. He bumped into four racists near Russell Square tube station. He got a torrent of racial abuse. And before he gets his ticket through the turnstile, the gang are on him. One smashes a bottle on his skull, cutting open his face. Clutching his head, pouring blood, he gets through the barrier. But the gang come back. One hurls abuse and stones at him. The attacker is dragged away, not once, but twice by his mates. Despite several days hospital care, the victim will be scarred for life. Let's make the gang who did it marked men. Jamie, it was a terrible, terrible injury, wasn't it? I mean, look at that poor guy, but it could have been so much worse. I know, another centimetre, Fiona, and that could have severed a nerve in his face and left one side of it paralysed. The thing is, when you look at that CCTV, they had a go at him, the attackers, and then they came back and had another go at him. They hurled racial abuse, they were aggressive. If he hadn't got through that barrier, I dread to think what would have happened. So what do you know about the attackers, then? Well, what we can tell you, there's four Asian guys uh, in 20 to 24 years of age, the one with the shaved head and the black top was the one shouting most of the abuse. He had to be dragged away. His mate in the sleeveless green top is fairly muscular. And the third guy in the bright red T-shirt had sunglasses perched on the top of his head. I mean, he had a white motif on the top of that T-shirt. And the fourth guy, this is the guy we think actually did it. He used the bottle. He's quite slim, three-quarter length trousers and wearing a mustard-coloured T-shirt. Now, we know that that is not a great picture, but if you can put together this person with the other three, there's a group of four of them. If you know them, you can put them all together, give us a call, 0500 600 600. And if you've been a victim of crime and would like to talk to someone, you can call Victim Support on 0845 30 30 900. But now we've got some significant arrests to tell you about. Starting with one in June, where we featured the rape of three girls at the Appleby Horse Fair in Cumbria. A 17-year-old man from County Wexford has been arrested in the Irish Republic, and he's now awaiting extradition to the UK. In July, we asked for help to trace a man wanted for conning cash out of lone women. He'd pose as a firefighter or an ambulance worker to try to gain their confidence. As a result of the Crime Watch appeal, posters of the wanted man were put up in railway stations in nearby towns and cities. Police arrested Paul Carson, who's now been charged. Then last month, we showed CCTV of a man wanted in connection with a rape in Bromley in Kent. Three callers named the same man, and two hours later, Paul Flatman handed himself in. He's been charged with rape, and he's awaiting trial. In April, we tried to track down a rapist who attacked a woman in her home in East London's Brick Lane. Last week, 25-year-old Abdul Halisadir Mukim from Forest Gate was charged with rape, and he'll be in court in the new year. In July, we showed CCTV of a man wanted for a rape of a girl in Bristol. The same day, we found out the same man was believed to attack a student in Sheffield, so we appealed again in September. Three weeks ago, Gary Howe was charged with four counts of rape and three of attempted rape. He's in custody. In May, we featured the killing of Christopher Alanami, stabbed to death in a high street in Sheerness in Kent. Five men, all from South East London, have been charged with his murder. And finally, a case we featured in May, the terrible murder of 22-year-old Lucy Hargreaves, shot in her home in Walton in Liverpool. Her house was then set on fire. Now police have named a man they want to trace. He's 26-year-old Kevin Parle, also known as Joseph Kenneth Parle. And you couldn't miss him. He's six feet five. That's really big, with cropped ginger hair and a one-inch scar on the left side of his head. And he's also wanted in connection with another Liverpool murder. And there's a £10,000 reward. If you know him, call us on 0500 600 600. If you see him, don't approach him. Call 999. Nazyat Khan wanted out of her marriage. After 16 years, she just couldn't take any more. But her desire for a separation was something her husband couldn't take. He had other ideas. If anyone 
I just help. Please. Because it means so much. Nice. What are you doing? Come on, girls. And you know we've got to be at the mosque in five minutes. Turn the television off. I'm not going to say it again. I'm getting the good part. Put your shoes on. <coughs> Why okay, you darling, you get up too. We're going to go and see your sisters off. Where's my bag? Oh. There you are. Okay. Here is a set of keys. I'm going to go shopping to Tooting, so if I'm not back, you let yourselves in. Okay. Right, off we go. Come on, down. Go on, go on, darling, go on. So you remember what to do then, huh? Yeah. You've got the keys. Okay. Oh, look, your father's there. Assalamualaikum. Hi. Hi. Betty, how are you? Hi. Huh? Huh? Betty, Did you know it's my birthday? Oh, of course I remember. I bought you a lovely cake. And uh, if you want, I can put your name on it. Yeah. It's and I'm going to have a fairy on top. Fairy on top, of course. I promised you that last night, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. It's a lovely day. So what's Come your on, mosque uh, we're like? getting late. She's nice. Sorry, Mum. So what's the mosque? Is she alive? Yeah, she always does lollipops. Yeah. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Hi. 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 All right, girls. Hi. Come on so in. You're going to be good girls now, aren't oh, you? Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. okay, say bye to them. Bye. 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 Come on, we're going. She was just all the time, like, loving her kids and stuff. <laughs> she would, like, always go the extra mile just to make sure we were OK. Auzu billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Kalla, balla. Kalla, balla. Don't do anything. Just leave me alone. You never respect me, do you? You're in my head in. Yadim. I'm going to dance in my room. No! Atuna, Dalata. Stop! 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 Atuna, Allah. Don't be stupid. It's true. He never said that. Hey, wait. Your mom brought me to Mars to collect you. No, she hasn't. No, she has. Haven't seen she has. Her. She has. She has. Open the door. Get inside. Why can I hear get my little sister cry? Don't worry, cry. Come on, get inside. Nobody's there. What's get, good? get inside quickly. Get inside.
now. Go outside, okay? And pretend nothing happened. Yeah? Just pretend it's a normal day. Come on, let's go. It's not a normal come on. day. I said, come on, come on. You just don't Stop have my crying. mom. Zafa took okay. his family to a house in Croydon. <laughs> Next morning, come on. Come on, he on, went on, off, on. leaving his three daughters Keep behind. Keep walking. With their father gone, they tried to contact their mother, hoping beyond hope she was still alive. Pick up. Please pick up. Maybe she's in hospital. Leave a message. Hi. If you're there, please pick up the phone. It's us. Are you OK? Are you all right? I'm in Pakistan. I'm in Pakistan. I'm in Pakistan. और मैं उन्हें देख पालती हैं और बच्चे इस सैतरान जिस दिन पहले दिन देखे थे तो पांच साल तो बाद भी आज भी उस सैतरान बिल्कुल मैंने इसे लाइक स्पेशल ओकेजन बट वो लाइक बर्थडे या समथिंग यू नो होता है शी शुड बी देयर बड़ी आरोग्य तो होती नहीं अन्य क्या सानी माँ बहुत मतलब काम करनी चाहिए सांवास बच्चे लेकर लोग आने पालने से कि ऐसा न खर्चा पूरा करने से ऐसा नहीं माँ चलेगी ऐसे ज़िंदा ही न रहना चाहिए She never had a long life and like it it was cut short and now I just feel as if she won't ever be able to like rest properly because she's looking down. And he's seeing us upset. It's almost unimaginable, isn't it? Any family should have to endure that. Uh, the matter of interest, Zafa Iqbal only really spoke Urdu. We've got people here who speak Urdu as well, incidentally. But um, given the circumstances, we thought we'd spare you a blizzard of subtitles. So we had him, as you've seen, uh, speaking English in the reconstruction. Now, if you know anything about this case, we'll forget our normal number for a minute. If you know where Zafa Iqbal is, you can call these officers here on our special number. It's another free phone number, 0800 056 4777. And you can also call them if you're worried uh, about you or someone in your family, someone who's at risk from so-called honor crimes. All calls are confidential. Tim, not much honor in this crime, though. Uh, I mean, he not only killed his wife in front of his children, he actually attacked one of his children. Tonight's reconstruction only alludes to the violence he displayed to his own children in killing his wife. I, I know, I mean, you've been with the family ever, ever since the, the murder, and I know you've been in tears quite a lot of the time over it's, it's very distressing. We haven't been able to achieve justice for the family. This man's been wanted for five years. We strongly suspect that he's gone to Pakistan. Um, there'll be viewers tonight to this programme who've got family, friends back in Pakistan. What we want from them is, tell us, where is he? Where is he in Pakistan? Now, the, the son didn't take part in that reconstruction because he wasn't there at the time of the, of the killing, but actually the following day he discovered his mother's body. That's correct. He came, he discovered the note that the sisters had been forced to write and left on the front door. He broke into the house and discovered his mother dead. How can he ha have any honour for his father? It's terrible what his father has done. There is no honour in this, this violence at all. No he, one at all. He's effectively orphaned his family. That's correct. They've, they've had to be rehomed, moved to another part of the country. Uh, an elderly relative of uh, the victims has come over to this country from Pakistan. She doesn't speak a word of English. She's raising the children as her own. Well, uh, the oldest girl, at least, has always wanted this case on, on Crime Watch. We need to know, as you've heard from Tim, where Zafar Iqbal is. There is uh, no formal extradition treaty with Pakistan, but the Pakistanis have been very helpful in such cases. And if we know precisely where Iqbal is, there is a real possibility that an extradition will be granted. Pakistan is as aware as anybody else that a man like this who killed his wife threatened to kill one of his own children. He's dangerous. Wherever he is, he needs to be caught. Now, even on a fairly conservative estimate, someone isn't killed in Britain every month because they're thought to have brought dishonor on a family by rejecting a forced marriage, having the wrong boyfriend, even wearing makeup or the wrong clothes. Well, police are now trying to read the signs before these so called honor killings happen. Remember, that special number is 0800 056 4777. If there's someone you think is in danger from the kind of thing this family has had to endure. 
I mean, they didn't just murder my son. In a way, they murdered me, my wife, my children. Because our lives are finished. Beautiful, clever boy. When he was born, I uh, just loved him. Clever boy from when he was about seven, eight months old. He actually could talk. He loved living and he was enjoying his life. Every, everything was going for him. The father and brothers of a pregnant woman have been convicted of murdering her 19-year-old boyfriend in a so-called honor killing. A court heard that Arash Gorbani Zarin was stabbed 46 times because the family believed the relationship had brought dishonor upon them. There is no honor in any killing. Just devastation to us. And they are in prison. The girl's father, Chumia Ali, and her two brothers, Muji and Mam Noor, were found guilty of his murder. Arash was stabbed in his own car, and his body was tied to the driver's seat. Um, what pleasure did they get out of this? What honor did they get out of this? Honor is a great, a great um, important thing to have in the community. Honor, it's really about having respect for yourself and your family. When we traditionally talk about honor killings, you know, it's a very ancient idea, and it actually exists within the samurai in Japan who would fight for their honor. And also, the, we know of the story of Romeo and Juliet, two lovers from the wrong families. And so this is something that we in our society see as a very ancient and old problem, not as something that belongs in modern day society. But of course, we've got immigration here from people who've come from tribal societies, where up until 50, 60 years ago, and even today, they still live by those codes. Well, my parents wanted me to go, Back some of them, I'm like, marry this 21-year-old guy that I'd never seen and never met. Um, it, was, it was a shock to me. My dad started hating me as well, and my mum started beating me as well, and like, it came to the point where I had to leave, no matter what. Stephanie and Carmen Nirvana. Young girls who I see and who are victims of honor-based crimes, their lives are made hard. Um, they're restricted from freedom, they're restricted from the outside world. They could be badly beaten, they could be burnt. A man has been found guilty of murder for helping to kill a bride on her wedding day. He was angry that she wasn't marrying a blood relative. Sajja Bibi was found dead at her home in Birmingham in January. She'd been stabbed 22 times. We are facing a crisis of masculinity. A lot of young Asian men, particularly people from the Pakistani community or the Sikh community, don't actually have an idea of how to be men in this society. They have the ideas of what their fathers and their grandfathers brought over, and actually those ideas are not compatible with being a member of a democratic society, but they're also not compatible with being a good Muslim or a good Sikh. Our culture, there are strict boundaries on how people meet each other. If I saw my sister with a guy and I I didn't know the guy, it'd be trouble. Because I wouldn't like my sister walking with another guy. It'd be like, I'll do something. I wouldn't tell you what I'm going to do on camera. After. I'd smash him up. Seriously? I'd smash him up. I'd, you know, keep the crap out of him. What about your sister? Well, then she'd get beat up too. Who guy? Me. You sure? Trust me. It's best to resolve it by just we're actually talking because by fighting and killing you don't really resolve anything. Samira Nazir was a woman with much to live for. The 25 year old has a successful career and had fallen in love with a man she planned to marry. But her family didn't approve of him. Her brother and her cousin murdered her, stabbing her 18 times. If, if they did ever find out where I am and took me home, first of all, they would I'm sorry I have to say like this, but they'll beat the shit out of me. A murder's a murder. It shouldn't be different just because he's a family member and because they say it's culturally sensitive. For them to do this, they've got no reason. And for culture to be a reason, that's the most pathetic reason why we're here. Oh, they put this name to it. It's all wrong. 
What honor killing? Honor of honor of what? Well, DCI Jerry Campbell leads one of the teams in the Violent Crime Director. And Jerry, I don't know about you, but one of the things that really shocked me looking at that film there was the responses from the young men. And you might expect that kind of thing from, say, first generation. But these people are, well, you know, they're British to all intents and purposes. And this is the kind of thing they're saying. What can you do about this kind of crime? First of all, uh, Fiona, let's face it, these are cowardly acts committed um, against innocent uh, young men, women and children. Uh, absolutely dreadful acts. We're working with police forces from across the country, with government, with community groups, um, formulating plans to support victims and potential victims. Um, but we're also formulating plans to take on arrest and deal with um, deal with these suspects who will be prosecuted with the full force of the British law. Now, I know you're taking this very, very seriously now. You also know, you know for all sorts of reasons, that people won't necessarily want to come forward about this. They'll be frightened to come forward about this. So how can you help them? We totally understand the pressures that victims and witnesses face in these circumstances because the offences are committed by family members, community members, extended family members. In the studio tonight, we've got experienced police officers who are used to dealing with these crimes. Um, they are supported by um, survivors of these crimes. So people who've actually been through it? They, they've been through all this before. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel for some of the, for our victims and for, for, for witnesses. All calls will be treated sensitively, in confidence. I mean, that's but, the key thing, isn't it, Jerry? Because people will be terrified that you might blurt this out to the wrong person. We totally understand that. So the calls will be dealt with sensitively. We will not approach family members. We will not approach community, uh, community leaders. Um, we are completely aware of the pressures that uh, they are under um, when offences are committed by family members. Well, incidentally, the special free phone number again, let me just remind you, it's 0800 056 477. There are people here who speak Urdu and Punjabi, and the lines are open until 11 o'clock tonight. And after that, you can get information on where to find support from our website. So have a look, it's bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Mohammed. Our Zamani is our face number nine and the last four of our rogue gallery here. He's wanted for rape. He skipped bail and may have a catering job. He has links to Bristol, Manchester and London. Number ten is Geoffrey Hales, who's just done a stretch for ABH, but broke the terms of his probation order and has since gone AWOL. Number eleven here is Sean Sutton, wanted for attempted murder. The victim was shot several times at close range and is lucky to be alive. He's got an earring in his left ear and has connections to Streatham. And here, number 12, the last of our dirty dozen, is Gary Lee Johnson, originally from the Philippines. He's wanted for rape and perverting the course of justice. Another one who's jumped bail. If you know him or any of the others, give us a call here in the studio, 0500 600 600. Just going through calls on the Heather Barnett case, and we found uh, at least three and probably four more girls with the haircut. And interestingly, if these are right, it looks like he's very much still up to it. Uh, this one's from four weeks ago. Mother's uh, talked about her daughter having a haircut on a, on a bus. This one's one week ago, and more of these are coming in. And we've got some really good calls um, on another case from last time. If I can find this shirt, you might remember this. Very much uh, distinctive Exeter shirt. That... Uh, call this uh, shirt rather and the appeal we did last time help police eliminate quite a number of suspects it's one of the worst crimes the West Country has known in recent years but there is a real belief now that we're getting closer to the man the shirt is distinctive because there aren't many of these with an eight and we think it has uh, other words on it like this uh, the guy who wore it raped and nearly killed a woman back in July She'd been beaten, raped, stripped naked, and left with a fractured skull. You can see from this picture that it must have been a particularly violent struggle. We do know our victim was stalked. Here, you can see a man following her. He's got very dark hair and very light footwear. But what really makes him stand out is the red and white striped football shirt that he's wearing. We believe it's an Exeter City football shirt with the number eight in white on the back, and the words, we ate Argyle. 
David Prawatra is in charge of this inquiry. First, tell us about the victim. She's still pretty badly ill, I think. She's still in a serious condition. She's been in hospital for over 100 days, and uh, she suffered a severe brain injury. She is, however, making slow um, but steady physical progress. But after four and a half months, I mean, he really did try and kill her. This was a particularly vicious and serious attack. But now, look, there's a real chance of catching him. Not only have we eliminated some possible suspects from, from Crime Watch last time, you've now trawled through hours and hours of CCTV and come up with some really important pictures. We found an image of a male person in Exeter High Street who bears striking similarity to the description of the, the individual in the latter CCTV footage. So striking, it's hard to believe it's not the same person. He's in the same shirt and with four women. That's right. Is he hassling them? Tell us the story of this. Well, at first, when we saw the image, we thought that uh, he may not be connected with the females, but extensive CCTV research indicates that this individual um, has spent the evening with these girls. Two and a half hour period, we've seen him in the, uh, in the uh, South Street area, at approximately 10 past 2 in the morning. This is back in July, Saturday, like July the 23rd, something like that. 23rd of July. We've also seen him down in the quay with these four females, who we believe are the same four females, at approximately 20 to 1 that morning. And earlier on, on the night before, at 11.30, in Cathedral. So these four girls, I mean, they couldn't possibly know that they were in the company of one of Britain's most brutal rapists. Well, we believe he bears striking resemblance uh, in the description and the description of the clothing that he's wearing. And if he's not involved, we can quickly eliminate him through forensic techniques. Well, let's at very least eliminate him. If you know him, if you are one of those girls, for heaven's sake, if you recognise that man, give us a call before he does this again. Let's hope we get a name a lot quicker in this case than with uh, another sex attacker, at least one who has now been put away. Yes, this one's a result, but it took 10 years. That's how long ago we asked for your help to find a man who preyed on schoolgirls. He dressed like a tramp and attacked in beauty spots in South London and Surrey. For a time, the trail went cold, and then a decade on, DNA got him. The tramp turned out to be an architect, a father of two, Anthony Dubois, who led a double life as a respectable family man and a sexual predator, disguising his voice as well as his appearance. Last month, he admitted assaulting six girls. He's been jailed for 13 years. In January, we featured the shocking kidnap and rape of a six-year-old girl in Blythe in Northumberland. You must have seen this in the news and in the papers. She was snatched from her bath as her mother dressed her brother. She was repeatedly abused in a car before being left naked in the snow in a back alley. Peter Voisey was found guilty of abduction, rape and sexual assault. He'll be sentenced next month. Four years ago, a teenager was raped in her home in Great Harwood in Lancashire. Her attacker followed her home before knocking on the door, forcing her inside and raping her. Last year, police got the vital DNA link they needed. The same man had raped two other women in nearby Nelson and Burnley. Local businessman Sean Greenwood was arrested and charged with three counts of rape. He pleaded guilty and he was jailed for life. You may remember in December we reconstructed the kidnap and torture of a man in New Cross in London. He was dragged from his car, he was taken to a flat where he was blindfolded, gagged and tortured. Dwayne Callender and James Thomas were convicted of conspiracy to kidnap and Daniel Lindo of false imprisonment. They're going to be sentenced next week. Last month we asked for your help to track down Daniel Glendinning. He'd been arrested with a stash of Class A drugs at his flat, then he went on the run. After the programme, he handed himself in. He's now been jailed for three years. Also last month, we asked you to keep an eye out for Paul Rupri, who was wanted for an armed robbery in Weston in Lincolnshire. Well, he caught himself on the programme too. He handed himself in. Last week, he pleaded guilty. He's awaiting sentence. In May, we featured Raymond Greenall, a dangerous sex offender who'd gone missing. One caller recognised him and told us that Greenall had been living in Wigan under another name. He got wind police were onto him and he fled to Blackpool, where he was eventually arrested. He was jailed for a year. Finally, a shocking outcome to a shocking case. Last month, we re-examined one of the oldest cold cases we have ever looked at. A series of sex attacks 22 years ago in Salisbury. Well, again, it was DNA that cracked it. The rapist had a habit of tying up his victims with bright blue rope, and he wore a very distinctive tartan jacket, two clues that were to prove vital. And in saying how he got into one victim's flat, he used a phrase that gave his job away. How did 
did you get in here? Monkey jumped the window. Well, viewers rang in saying monkey jump was a phrase used by phone cable engineers. Another call to Crime Watch gave police a name, and detectives visited Christopher Downs. Now, he'd been cable laying in the area at the time of the attacks. He reluctantly provided a DNA sample. But just days before the results were due back, confirming he was indeed the rapist, Downs gassed himself and his wife in their car. When uh, police went to his home, they found the blue rope, and they found the very jacket that he'd used in those attacks back in 1984. Downs had been jailed after those attacks for a series of other offences, including attempted rape and slashing the face, arms and chest of a Southampton prostitute. It does look as though his wife knew some of this. Uh, from letters that Downs had sent to her from jail, he talked about knowing what he called his deepest, darkest secrets. Detectives uh, are now trying to trace his movements over the years to try and identify other attacks that he may have made against women. Now, if you ever needed proof that the consequences of rape can reverberate for years, when you say that, I mean, this is surely it. Now, if you've been a victim of crime, you can call victim support. That's on 0845 30 30 900. Now, Rav, how's tonight looking so far? The phones have been red hot yet again, which is fantastic stuff. We showed you right at the start a brutal attack, a brick attacker, in fact, for, in Birmingham, first on an elderly lady and then on a pregnant woman. I don't know which is worse. We've had lots of really good calls flooding in, over 30 already. Uh, we've had many local names that have been suggested for that guy, which is excellent work, and some of those are so good, the police are very, very excited about those already. The lines are still open, just because the programme's coming to a close doesn't mean that the lines are, so if you can help with any of our cases, please do get on the phone and give us a call. A reminder, you can find the details of all tonight's cases at our website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Our phone lines, as always, are open until midnight tonight, so we've got a couple of hours yet, and then from 7.30 until midnight tomorrow. All the detectives here can pass on incident room numbers if you want them, and uh, they come up on your screens at the end of the Crime Watch update. And incidentally, several people have complained about the use of the term Asperger's in the context of crime. I mean, frankly, that's what a profiler told us, just as if he'd been tall or short. And we're back after the news with the update at 10.40. Late in some regions, do join us if you can. Crime Watch back in three weeks. That's on Monday, the 27th of November. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well for now. Good night. Good night. <laughs> And viewers in Northern Ireland can see Crime Watch updates at around a quarter to twelve here on BBC One.